uh, start. Uh, let's uh, welcome Jesper Lipsen uh, from Monash. And uh, I think I know you see me in my head. <laughs> let's see. Uh, Jesper did his PhD at the Ennis War Institute. And then he, no, his uh, master's. Uh, and he did his PhD in Boulder, Colorado. And then he was a postdoc in Paris. That's right. Mm -hmm. And then you went here. Oh, I yeah. stopped by Cambridge. The way. I stopped by Cambridge. You were postdoc in Cambridge also. Yes. Okay. Then he was a postdoc in Cambridge. Then he was at the Aarhus Institute of Advanced Study, working with me and Mira. And then, okay, now it's getting fuzzy. Then you went to Australia. Yes. Yeah. And he's now a professor in Australia together with uh, Mira. And they are a powerhouse in uh, photon physics, few body physics. Both in uh, atomic gases and recently they've also spread into uh, to the solid state platform. And uh, I've had the pleasure to work with them uh, on a couple of occasions. It's very nice. It's also uh, stressful because it's always two against one. <laughs> but, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Thanks, Theo. Very nice and honest introduction. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, yeah, thanks everyone for coming today. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to be back in Aarhus to, to present some of the work we've done in recent years. And thanks to Jan for organizing this also. And, uh, yeah, it's really good to be back. I also wanted to say if, if anyone has any questions at any point during the talk, just interrupt me, please. Uh, I'm very happy to take questions. Um, so, what I'll talk about today is uh, quantum impurity problems and, uh, like, like Gear was saying, uh, we've been working on these both in the context of cold atomic gases, but also more recently in, in the context of doped semiconductors. And these are really, it's the same kind of problems just appearing in, in different contexts. It's the same formalism we use to describe them. And the results, although they look different, they're just often just plotted on different axes because, you know, we have different observables in the different systems. So really, a lot of the phenomenology is, is common to these systems. And, and so that's you know, part of the reason why a lot of uh, theorists are working in both fields now. Um, OK, so uh, and, and I also wanted to introduce Monash University. So we have these kind of crazy buildings at Monash. So this here is, is a chemistry, as you might have guessed from the shape of the building. So uh, it's a very new campus. We have lots of new buildings. And uh, it's, it's kind of an exciting place to be, actually, because we have, you know, we've hired just in the seven years that we've been at Monash now, we've hired more than 10 new people at, uh, in physics. So it's really, you know, happening at the moment. Uh, okay, so, but impurities actually don't even only appear in, you know, cold atomic gases and, and, uh, and semiconductors. They even appear in neutron stars. Um, uh, where you have, for instance, you have a small like, mixture of protons in, in a neutron medium. Uh, so there you again have more or less the you know, same kind of formalism should apply in these systems in the inner crust of neutron stars. Uh, they appear also as these absorption peaks in semiconductors where you can really change uh, an applied voltage here. Um, and you can look at essentially, you know, you change the photon energy here and you, you get these kind of absorption features as a function of, of essentially how many electrons you have in the system. And this is related to how um, when you shine light on the semiconductor here, you excite what is called an exciton, uh, an electron hole pair, and it gets stressed by the electronic medium in this doped system here. And you can essentially, you can have an attractive branch where you attract all the electrons, or you can have a repulsive branch where you repel the electrons, and that gives you gives rise to these two different branches. But really what I want to emphasize is that actually, apart from you know, all these various systems here, it's a very fundamental problem. Because you can, you can think of, of it as just being the question of, say I, I have a single impurity in a medium. I turn on interactions between the impurity and the medium. What happens? How does the system behave? behave how, what are the properties of the ground state? What are the dynamical properties, etc.? So we really want to describe this object here, which is an impurity interacting with some <coughs> big medium. Um, okay, I think I've already said all this here, but but the key idea is that we want to describe essentially this system here as what is called a quasi-particle. So it behaves like a particle, in some sense similar to the original impurity, but now it had, has. Uh, 
you know, changed properties because every time this impurity, for instance, moves in the medium, it will drag excitations of the medium along with it. So that introduces the concept of a quasi particle. Okay, so I have quite a, an ambitious outline. We'll see if I get through everything. But um, um, essentially, what I want to discuss first are different probes of this system here. Um, these are two different probes that have been applied in the context of cold atomic gases, so called radio frequency spectroscopy, um, where you really you know, shine light on your system and you change your impurity atoms either into or out of some interacting state and you look at the response uh, of the system. But what you can also do is you can essentially uh, consider your impurities as some two level systems that where you can uh, have Rabi oscillations between the different levels. And, and now uh, you look at these Rabi oscillations in the presence of interactions with the medium. And so what happens? Uh, then what I'll discuss afterwards is, is uh, some questions about the nature of the Fermi polaron. Um, so first of all, I want to talk about how it evolves with temperature and what we can tell about um, the nature of the ground state, even though experiments are at finite temperature. And then I want to focus on the so-called so repulsive polaron, uh, which is quite interesting because it's a metastable branch. So remember how I said we have two different branches. We have this repulsive branch and an attractive branch. And the repulsive is a, is a kind of metastable excited branch. And so there has been a lot of debate about the, the sort of origin <coughs> of its um, finite lifetime. And so what I want to talk about this is in the context of two different experiments, both an ultra-cold Fermi gas and an uh, atomically thin <coughs> semiconductor, and both how these two things are similar and, and there are also some important differences. And finally, uh, I hope I'll have time to talk briefly about polar and polar and interactions, again in the context of semiconductors. Um, okay, so let me begin uh, by setting the scene here. So let me assume that my impurity has two different spin states. Let me call them spin down and spin up. So these could be, for instance, two different hyperfine states of an atom. Now I can imagine two different scenarios for, for instance, radio frequency spectroscopy. I can either go, in, go from this non-interacting system to the interacting system, which is called injection spectroscopy, or I can do the reverse thing here. And essentially what injection spectroscopy is, it, it probes all the possible kind of states that have a finite overlap with this initial state here. Whereas ejection spectroscopy probes essentially the strongly correlated many-body system here, uh, but it's again, you know, uh, I'm projecting it onto this non-interacting state. And we have these radio frequency pulses that can drive these transitions. And, um, and this, the rate of transfer as a function of the frequency of, of this uh, transition here gives uh, access to the impurity spectral function. Um, and there have been several experiments on this here, both in terms of injection spectroscopy, for instance, there's this paper here, um, I think Gail was on this paper back uh, in the early days of impurity physics. Um, so here again we have, this is a cold atomic gas, where we have um, is potassium impurities in a lithium Fermi gas. And again, we have this attractive branch here, and we have a repulsive branch here. And we see how this spectrum here probes both these two branches here and some continuum in between. Um, so this is as a function of interaction strength. But we can also <coughs> imagine, for instance, sitting at a fixed interaction strength and probing, for instance, the temperature dependence. And this is what was done at MIT in the group of Martin Svierlein. Uh, in this ejection spectroscopy measurement where they observed essentially how the, um, uh, the spectral peak moved essentially from this value here at around uh, minus 0.6 or 7, something like that, to around zero. And so they saw a quite kind of abrupt change as a function of, of temperature in this, in this experiment. Um, okay, so you can do both of these things here. And what we realized a couple of years ago is that actually these two spectroscopies, in the ideal case where your impurities are completely uncorrelated, they're actually related to each other. So this is kind of a, it's a detailed balance condition. 
but it's a detailed balanced condition, not where these two different things are in thermal equilibrium, <coughs> but it's a detailed balanced condition where the injection and ejection rate are, are related. And what we see here is that they're related by this factor here. This uh, is a constant factor. So first of all, there's some exponential prefactor, but and, and we flip the sign of the frequency. But there's also this constant factor here. And it turns out that this constant factor here is, is just a difference in free energy between this strongly interacting system here and a non-interacting system. So this really tells you that if you're in the, in the ideal case where you can do linear response at, at low impurity concentration, then actually these two spectroscopies here should be completely equivalent. So is the yes. assumption here that yellow impurity only interacts with the surrounding blue atoms? Yes, yes, yes. And in, indeed, you can actually you can generalize this here to the case where you have different interactions in the two cases as well. Yeah. But this is sort of the ideal scenario that cold atoms is probably. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So that's so that's I think an important result for RF spectroscopy, and it will be important also in the following. But I wanted to talk also about another probe here. Because what we can also imagine is that we now put on a Rabi drive, or experimentalists do this, between these two different impurity spin states. So we can flop between spin up and spin down at some rate here. And again, now we're probing, you know, essentially we're probing these two different uh, scenarios here. <coughs> and what we'll find is that the population in the system here, as a function of time, now, uh, you know, is stopping between the two different states, but depending on the interaction strength here, we see that there's both a dampening and a change in the, in the frequency here. Uh, so this is an experiment uh, from a few years ago. And, and indeed, this, uh, the frequency of, of the oscillations here is related to the bare rabbit drive here uh, with some coefficient here, which is just the overlap between the interacting state here and the non-interacting state here. So, so indeed, you can actually, from this dynamical probe here, you can probe properties of the equilibrium um, state of, of this, this system here. So, so that's kind of also interesting. So essentially, what you're doing is you're, you're coupling these two different kind of, spin, uh, of spectral functions. Of course, here you just have a, a kind of trivial spectral function. And here you have a more complicated <coughs> spectral function. And now, um, by applying a, you know, a range of, let's say, reasonable assumptions on the problem here, we can find a kind of simplified expression for, for this behavior here, which shows that we have a certain damping in the system, which is related to the width here of your repulsive polar and peak. So this is specifically the repulsive branch that we wanted to, to probe. Um, and you have this factor here, which is originating from this, and there's actually a small correction to the frequency related to the damping itself. Um, okay, so before I, I actually go to the results, I'll just talk very briefly about how we model this kind of dynamics. So like I said, we have, we have our impurities here uh, with some dispersion. We have our medium particles, which are fermions, again with some dispersion and some chemical potential. Um, and and what I want to emphasize is that actually we find it convenient in the single impurity problem to work in a case where we have um, you know, a canonical ensemble for our single impurity, so we have fixed number of particles there, whereas we're used a, using a grand canonical ensemble for the, for the medium particles. So this turns out to be kind of interesting, a uh, convenient way of, of describing it. Now all of this here, you can just think of the, that as some kind of interaction term between the fermions and the impurities. Um, here I've chosen to use a two-channel model because that's necessary to describe some of the, of the experiment, but that's sort of a detail. Um, but, but essentially what we can think of is the system here is described by a scattering amplitude which has a, a scattering length and potentially also an effective range. Um, Okay, and, and now in order to do time dynamics and potentially take into account temperature, what we do is we, uh, we uh, uh, introduce some variational operators for the system here. 
Um, and these variational operators here, they consist of terms where I have you know, higher and higher order uh, particle hole excitations of the medium. So what we can think of this here as, this here is a bare impurity with some weight here. And this here is, is a term where my impurity has excited a particle hole pair here and is taking some recoil here. And again, I have some weight here, which is some weight function in my variational approach. And now, in order to do dynamics, what I can do is I can introduce an error operator, which is the difference between, essentially this here is a Heisenberg equation of motion that I have on the right-hand side. Of course, that would usually be equal to zero. But in fact, once I, I have made a truncation of my Hilbert space, this here is not zero. So this is actually some finite operator. And now I can define an error quantity here, which is a trace over this uh, error operator, kind of squared. Um, and I can now um, minimize this error quantity here with respect to my weight functions. Um, and what I want to emphasize is that this, this here gives you a very nice kind of variational approach for dynamics in the system. It works at finite temperature in particular because I've taken kind of um, Operators for the for the impurities, I can now apply it to any arbitrary state of the Fermi gas. So I can have any kind of uh, superposition of states. And and this you can prove because of the structure here that this uh, approach here is exact at short times, or also in the high temperature limit where you get kind of cluster expansions. Um, okay. So now first let me talk about uh, temperature evolution, how we can describe that of this system here. So like I said, the injection and ejection spectroscopies are related by this free energy here. And it turns out that this free energy is in turn related to what we call the contact, which is uh, a quantity that quantifies the strength of the correlations between impurity and medium particles. How, um, how often we see the impurity close to a medium particle. And now we can use this variational theory uh, using our uh, realization that this contact actually gives us this relation, relation between the injection and ejection uh, spectroscopy. <coughs> and uh, what we find here is the contact as a function of temperature at unitarity. And this is for lithium atoms in a lithium Fermi C. Um, and, and here, this here is. Um, Maybe let's just forget about this. Maybe I just want to talk about this figure here. So this is equal masses. Um, what we see here is that our calculated contact has this non-monotonic dependence uh, as a function of temperature. And that actually matches the experiment extremely well, at least with an error bias. Um, now, the reason, the origin for this non-monotonic behavior here is actually kind of, is is non-trivial, but you can kind of understand it if you think about the phase diagram of the system. So I have, like I said, I have my attractive branch here, I have a repulsive branch here, but actually what I didn't mention before is that there's this other branch here, which is where the impurity binds to a particle from the Fermi C and forms a molecule. And eventually this molecule actually becomes a ground state here. So at unitarity, <coughs> this molecule here sits as an excited state. But, but it has a larger slope um, than the ground state here, right? So, so if you look at the, at the change as a function of one on A here, this, this here has a larger slope than this. And so once you go to finite temperature, actually the reason why you're increasing the contact initially is that you're, ex, you're, um, you're seeing the effect of these excited states here. And then eventually, at large temperature, your contact has to go to zero because you're going to work an ideal gas limit. Um, okay. Are there any questions about any of this? Yes? What's the difference between this theory and just doing naive putting in Fermi functions in the... Oh, um, like some oh. like ladder or something. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you can do this in terms of ladder diagrams as well. I think what people hadn't realized is that the contact can be written as an integral over the ejection spectral function, uh, where you introduce now 
the self energy in terms of letter diagrams, for instance. But you can calculate it also like that. Yeah. We found numerically actually it was easier to do it in a discrete formulation. Um, but and that's because of the large exponential tails in the problem. And, and the red points are again the uh, marking points? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so that fits quite nicely here. So that's an experiment from a few years ago. Um, what we can also do is actually we can look at this here not only at unitarity, but we can look at the at the temperature evolution uh, as a function of interaction strength. So what we're doing here is well, here's a plot of the free energy and here's a plot of the contact. And what you see here is that the free energy, if I plot it like this here, and it's, I measured it with respect to the kind of bare two-body binding energy. Um, here, I, I see that I have this crossing here, which is this uh, transition to this molecular state that I was talking about before. Now, if I look at finite temperatures, so this is point one here, this red, these red dots here, and point two here is the blue lines, uh, blue dots here. I see that now I get something that's very smooth at, across this. You can think of this as a single particle phase transition where it binds a particle. Um, and actually, this, um, you know, it's difficult to see anything interesting happen in, in the free energy here at finite temperature. But what you can see is actually in the contact, if I instead plot the contact, which, as I said, was uh, related to the derivative of the free energy, then I find that here in this regime where I'm uh, kind of in, in the uh, regime where I have deep bound pairs, as a function of temperature, the contact is going this way here. Uh, so I have 0 0.1, 0 0.2 TF temperature. On the other hand, over here, the temperature is initially, uh, the contact is going up with temperature initially. So that means that I'll have some non-monotonic behavior in the vicinity of, of this single particle phase transition here. Like for instance here, I see I go from 0 to 0.1 to 0.2 here. So this non-monotonic behavior of the contact is actually related <coughs> to this underlying phase transition, or single impurity phase transition. Now, the question is, can you see this in experiment? And at least so far, the, the answer is no. So this here is an experiment from uh, uh, Yoav Saki uh, um, a couple of years ago. And if you, if you plot the contact here on a, on a large scale here, you see that actually this matches the theory quite well. But now if you zoom in, if you subtract the, the part that's just coming from two-body binding energy, uh, then you see that actually we really need to get the error bars down to, to really see if there's anything interesting happening here. All right. Um, so now, uh, yes, okay, I have time. So now let me switch to really focusing on this repulsive polar and branch. So I want to focus on that both in the context of cold atomic gases and, and, uh, and semiconductors. So by, by this repulsive branch, I really mean this branch here, which you know, can, in, in principle, decay down to either this molecular branch or to this attractive polar branch here. So it's a metastable state. It's quite difficult to describe theoretically. Um, and, you know, um, well, so it's a challenge to us theorists and, and I guess also to experimentalists. Um, and it's been observed both in 3D and in 2D in various experiments. Um, and one fundamental question that, that people have been asking about is actually what is the nature of the broadening of this repulsive polar on here? Is it that it decays into these lower energy states like this here? Is that what really describes or determines the positive particle lifetime? Or is it something else? And so we went about this by investigating uh, Rabi oscillation data. First of all, from uh, the experiment that I was talking about before um, uh, by Skatsa et al, which is in a 3D lithium gas, but also in a 2D ytterbium gas. And so we did this um, variational time-dependent um, uh, method. And what, what you see here is that we can describe the Rabi oscillations extremely well in the weakly interacting limit. Also, as we get to stronger interactions, we describe both the damping and the, and the frequency of these uh, systems here. 
Now, in the extremely strongly interacting limit where the repulsive branch is, is just a you know, big blob, a uh, broad blob, uh, then it becomes, becomes quite difficult, but uh, still we get something that actually does not compare too badly with the experiment. Now, similarly, in, in 2D, we, we see something very similar where we can describe extremely well the Rabi oscillations, both the frequency and the damping of the Rabi oscillations. And so that gives us uh, confidence that we're actually understanding the underlying physical processes, even though we're only including this one particle hole excitation of the medium. So now from this, we can extract the damping of these, uh, of these Rabi oscillations. Uh, both in 2D and in 3D. And we do this in, in different ways. So, so the experiment are these black dots here. Um, and what we see is that this experiment here matches extremely well with uh, the same extraction of the Rabi damping from our theory lines, which is, are these blue kind of uh, symbols, symbols here. Uh, and this is the case both in 2D and in 3D, although in 3D, uh, close to unitarity, we start to see some, some deviation. Um, and more, moreover, this actually uh, also matches the width of the quasi-particle peak calculated within this single particle hole pair, uh, ansatz that I was talking about. Um, so all of these kind of methods, they agree quite well with each other. But what's important to emphasize here is that this theory that we've developed here, it does not contain the decay channel from this repulsive branch to the attractive branch. Um, so we are only describing you know, the uh, impurity that's getting dressed by the medium, but we cannot describe the process where it, uh, where it essentially decays to the lower branch because that it re requires additional particle hole pairs. So if you thought that the decay rate to the attractive branch is the primary kind of damping mechanism, then you would have thought that you shouldn't be able to describe the experiment. But actually, we, we describe it quite well. So OK, so our uh, explanation for this, and I know Geo violently disagrees with this, um, is that this here is uh, an effect of what we call many-body defacing. So essentially, it's because you know, you have interactions between the impurity and the medium, and these interactions push the impurity energy up into the two-body uh, two scattering continuum. And now this essentially leads to a broadening of this line here. So it's because you have a, a discrete line coupled to a continuum. And we can calculate this broadening here, uh, which scales like the scattering length to the fourth power. Um, and we can compare this with the decay rate of, of so-called three-body recombination processes, which are known to scale like the scattering length to the sixth power. <coughs> so we see that at least at, at relatively weak interactions and up to about KFA equal to one, uh, we actually describe um, this process here dominates over this process here. Um, and so this really shows that uh, at least the weak interactions, collisional relaxation is not the dominant decay channel. <coughs> um, okay, sorry. I thought I had another slide in this. Um, did you want to stop me here? Or? Yeah, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, okay, so let me just describe now some more recent experiments from, um, from solid state where actually we see the opposite behavior which is kind of interesting. So, um, okay, so let me first describe what, what I'm showing here. So here, once again, we have an impurity problem. In this case here, it's excitons, which is immersed in a Fermi sea of electrons. So in this case here is uh, molybdenum diselenide. Um, and, and in this system here, uh, the, the, the sample is gated, so we can control of not we, uh, the experimental group uh, of uh, Elaine Lee, they can control the doping in the system here. So they can either go to positive electron doping here or negative electron doping here. So we're focusing on this positive, uh, on the electron doping rather than whole doping. 
And once again, so this here is, is re reflecting spectra and it's actually very difficult to see uh, on this color, uh, on, this, on this projector here, but you see again, you see this. Here, we just have the bare exciton branch. And now as we go to this electron doping, we see first that there's a repulsive polaron branch here. And then as we increase the doping, we see more and more evidence of an attractive polaron here. And now in this context here, what we should think of this doping here as doing is, is it's changing the Fermi energy here. So now uh, the energy diagram looks sort of flipped on its head. Now we have energy as a function of Fermi energy and we keep the interactions fixed. So in cold atoms, we're always varying the interaction strength. Here we are instead varying the doping level. And now again, we get this repulsive polaron and it could potentially decay to the attractive polaron. Uh, can you, can you, uh, sorry, this is uh, yes. super new to me. Uh, can you, uh, what does the picture reflect and how do I get these lines? Maybe it's also the projector. Then. It's so the projector. I, I so so there's, a, <laughs> there's a white blot here, uh, okay. but it's weaker than this here. Um, but it's very difficult it's very, to see. Ah, now, now we get, okay. Yeah. So what, why you put the tractor <laughs> on this? So the, the, the dashed lines and outlines where that, the ridge of that Long yeah, so exactly, exactly. Okay, and then there's some black there, the repulsive photon. How should it? Yes, be? so there again, you see it's kind of following it right here, but it actually okay. very quickly disappears. So the repulsive photon, like I said, it becomes very broad, okay. and essentially the peak disappears already here. And this is what well, the, the axes are. So if this is done. How is this done incrementally? Um, so this is reflective spectra. So so you take your two D material, you gate it. Um, uh, to, to have a fixed doping in the system mm -hmm. and, and then you shine a laser on it and you look at essentially what gets transmitted, what gets reflected. So okay. what is the fraction of the light that gets reflected from the sample? And this gives you an indication of what is the absorption of the sample. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if you have a cut along the horizontal axis, you will see at least two peaks, one for a cluster. Point. Yes, the yes. Positive. So a cut here would, would show this peak here and uh, a much broader kind of peak here. Yes. Okay. But that's when the main X star peak goes away, then these two shows up. Yes, yes. So the main X ton peak is just that's uh, in the absence of doping here. And so that's very broad, uh, very bright. And uh, now here, you know, you really get this transfer spectral wave from the repulsive <coughs> form to the attractive form. But this is really just to characterize, to see that these polarant branches are there. This is not the main experimental result. So let me, maybe let me get, go to the main experimental result. So what they're actually doing in this experiment here is this four-way mixing type experiment. Uh, so they, they do this two-dimensional coherent type of spectroscopy where they essentially what they have is they have three different pulses here. Uh, will, you know, distinct momenta and frequencies. Um, and now they can measure up, you know, you can think of this here as, as a fourth wave, but they, they measure a particular combination of these, uh, of these pulses. So if this here has momentum K1, K2, K3, then they can, for instance, measure at the position of the momentum minus K1 plus K2 plus K3. And so this gives, you know, one, let's say counter rotating uh, term in your frequency and two rotating terms in your frequencies. So essentially, um, this allows you to pick out specific um, channels that are contributing to, to a, a signal. So you have, you know, if you have three pulses and they both have, you know, a, a co rotating and counter rotating part, you have eight different possibilities, but you can pick out just one of them in the experiment. The nice thing about this here is that it gives you access to uh, these now two-dimensional spectra. And these are really, um, this is really beyond linear response. So uh, on, on these spectra here, what you do is you Fourier transform the time between the first two pulses and the time between the third pulse and the, and the measurement. And uh, in the simplest kind of analysis, uh, you, you, can, you can think of, of this axis here as the absorption energy, which is this corresponding to this time here, this time is kept fixed. 
And this time here is, a, uh, is Fourier transformed to the emission energy. So, uh, and then you can do this at different voltages. So you can do it, for instance, uh, with a zero voltage, zero volt, where you're here, where you just have the exciton peak. And indeed, we see that we are absorbing and emitting at the exciton peak. But now you can start increasing the doping in the system. And you see these other peaks kind of appearing. Uh, so for instance, at 0.7 volts here, you should see this uh, repulsive polarized peak here. And indeed, what you, what you see if you analyze the, the peak shape here, you see that it's shifted from this exciton, uh, bare exciton peak here. So this is, this is an, a repulsive polarized. And indeed, you also see very weak, uh, weakly, you see this attractive polarized peak here. And now you can increase the doping here. Uh, now, as you increase the doping, this repulsive polarized completely disappears. And indeed, this peak here is gone. Right? And now we only have the attractive polarized. And if you increase uh, the doping even more, then even this attractive polarized here becomes very broad and, and difficult to characterize. Um, but OK, so, so what this gives us access to is, first of all, the energies of these systems here. But it also gives us access to actually the, the lifetime broadening of this. Because the lifetime broadening is related to now the, the width of the signal along this diagonal here. And so if you um, now what you can do is you can take your signal here and you can, you can fit the shape of, this, uh, of a signal, for instance, this is a diagonal cut through the repulsive polarized peak. And what you can find then is the, the peak position and the width. And so this gives us access to the repulsive polarized energy and uh, lifetime growth. Okay? And you can do, of course, the same for the attractive polarized. Um, and, and the results kind of in bare parameters uh, are these ones here. So what, what you see is that the repulsive polarized here here we just have like a baseline here. That's when it's just purely exotonic. But now as we hit a certain voltage, um, we start to dope the system. And indeed we see that the repulsive polarized uh, width grows very, very rapidly. Whereas the attractive polarized width stays fairly constant until something happens that we honestly still don't quite understand. But we have some ideas. Um, but essentially, so this shows Again, uh, the attractive polarized is, is uh, the ground state in the system, and so we would expect that it does not broaden with doping, and indeed we see that it stays fairly constant here. Likewise, the energies, we see that the repulsive polarized actually, if you analyze this data here, you see that it has this, uh, it goes relatively linearly, which is the line that we had on the previous, uh, on the reflectance data, and we also have this attractive polarized here. Now, there are many reasons why the attractive polarized can start to kind of uh, move up because you can get effects like band gap renormalization in these systems here. So actually, the best measure of, um, of polarized physics is not to look at the, at the energies themselves, but the difference between the energies. And if you now plot that as a function of doping, then you find that it actually grows like uh, uh, is essentially three half times a year. Somehow we didn't write that here. Um, and that's what the theory predicts. So we find an extremely good agreement here. And that's, we don't have any fitting parameters in the theory here. We just, we just do this kind of uh, variational theory and it just comes out to, to fit. There are no fitting parameters that are specifically related to this. We just take the Fermi energy, the masses, these kind of things, put them in and out comes this line. Uh, we can also look at the oscillator strength, which is, is the residue in the system. And we find that the re repulsive polarized residue and attractive polarized residues here behave essentially like, uh, you know, in the, in the theory. So essentially this peak here, the weight is transferred from the repulsive branch to the attractive branch here as we increase dope. The only place where we don't find good agreement with the theory is for the, for the width which is kind of a mystery because I was just arguing that we find excellent agreement for the repulsive polar and width in the case of cold atoms. So actually, I should say this dashed purple line here is our theory. 
Um, so this was kind of a mystery um, because, like I said, we had excellent agreement for the repulsive polar atom in the cold atomic gas. So what's going on? What's, what's the green one? Is one line that yeah, so, so that's our new and improved theory ah. <laughs> <laughs> that I'll discuss now. Um, so in the cold atomic gas, um, one of the reasons why we had this H to the 6 behavior of the three-body recombination to lower uh, levels was because we, it necessarily involves two identical fermions. And so this um, means that uh, this process is suppressed. But in, in the semiconductor case, actually, what we do is, uh, or what the experimentalists do is that they, they excite the exciton in one so-called valley in momentum space. And these uh, ex electron hole excitations address this exciton here are primarily in the opposite valley. And this sort of process here is, is suppressed because these, these involve identical fermions. But now we can still have three-body recombination where essentially this process here, you go from the repulsive branch by exciting a particle hole pair in this valley here um, uh, and, and going down to the attractive polarized branch. So we can estimate the rate at which this happens using just a simple kind of Fermi's golden rule calculation. And actually the final result here that we find fits within a factor of two. So it's, it has a factor of two too much, but I mean, this is just a Fermi's golden rule back of the envelope calculation. So, um, so we think that this, you know, this is actually, this is evidence that this is actually physics related to the two values. So, in other words, because we have dressing now, we have the possibility of, of exciting particle hole pairs here. Actually, this changes this power of the repulsive attractive polar and decay from uh, this power here, which would be if, if uh, I did three-body recombination involving this valley here, to this power here. Uh, and this uh, theory fits quite well. So I don't know. If I have more time, actually, because I also wanted to talk about interactions. If I yeah, spend some more minutes, sure. Okay, okay. So let me just uh, spend a little bit of time talking about another experiment by Jeff Davis at Swinburne. Uh, so this uh, kind of I want to ch change gears a little bit and talk about interactions between attractive polarons. So this material here is uh, tungsten disulfide. And it's quite an interesting material because it has a very intriguing band structure. So let me just explain. So all the, all the bright excitons in this system here, they involve um, this upper band here, upper conduction band. So I have you know, bright excitons here, bright excitons here, etc. So I have two different bright excitons. And they involve the upper conduction band. Now when I start to dope the system, I will dope the system in the lower conduction bands, here or here. So that's this block here or this block here. Now, because of this fine structure uh, of the band structure, I actually I have different possible uh, trions in the system. I have four different uh, three-body bound states. So I can form a bound state like, bound state like this here, which is a singlet, so-called singlet trion. It involves the spin-up exciton, which is this red guy here, and a spin-down electron from this Fermi signal. Likewise, I can form the opposite singlet triad, but I can also form this triplet triad here, which involves three electrons, uh, three particles, um, two electrons with the same spin here, and it has a slightly uh, smaller binding energy. So, so this is kind of interesting. I have four different uh, three-body bound states, and so I should have also related several different attractive polarons in this system. So um, in this experiment, likewise, they do this um, 2D uh, spectroscopy. So we have the absorption here. We have the, uh, the emission here. We have a repulsive polaron here. We have an attractive polaron here. And indeed, if you look at this attractive polaron peak here, you see that it has quite a lot of structure. There are all these different blocks here. So we want to try and analyze what's happening here. Um, 
Okay, and it turns out that these different blocks, they're actually related to uh, interactions between polarons. And the interactions work as follows. Um, so what they can do is, so the, this, this experiment here was all by using linearly polarized light, but now you can do um, circularly polarized, so you can probe either this exciton here or this exciton here. So now, um, so here, if, if, you, if you excite two um, excitons of the same spin here, it turns out, um, okay, I, I should make one point first. In these multidimensional spectroscopies, you only see a signal if you have interactions between the different particles. You can show that if you don't have interactions, there's no signal. Um, so that's one of the really nice things about these multidimensional spectroscopies is that actually there are always evidence of some kind of interactions in the system. And here what we see is that if I have two excitons of the same spin, I only see a signal on the diagonal here. Okay? And that's a sign that I only have, a have interactions between these kind of three-body bound states involving a spin-up exciton and a spin-down electron. Uh, two identical uh, three-body states, or equivalently between the triangles. And the reason why there's only one block here is that we have inhomogeneous broadening that kind of merges the two peaks. And this is quite well carried out in the simulation. Um, likewise, if, if we now do the experiment where we do opposite spins of, in the system, so we really do a spin result measurement, then we see interactions between these guys here, so now we excite, for instance, a spin-down exciton and a spin-off exciton, and we see that they only interact if, if, the, if the polarons that we form, the attractive polarons that we form, they share the same electron here. And we don't have anything here. And indeed, we don't have anything on the diagonal here. And once again, this is carried out by the, the simulation. So let me just explain briefly what, this, what the theory does here. What we are assuming is that let me, let me first look at this situation here. So if I have two excitons here that are dressed, I have my two different attractive polarons, um, and they're dressed by two different fermices. So this is dressed by electrons in the, say, spin-off fermicy, and this one is dressed by electrons in the spin-down fermicy. I don't have any interference between them. They're non-interacting, and so I don't see a signal related to this. But now, if these two excitons, they try to dress themselves by the same electrons, then this electron here can only kind of interact with one of them. It's not available to interact with the other. So it's a sort of phase space filling effect um, that leads to interactions between these guys. And so we see that we, we really see that in the, in the simulations and in the experiment. Now, in the experiment, we also see these two additional blocks here. And they are actually related to an attractive bipolar state. Um, okay. So, um, so this phase-based filling argument is essentially that you know some some operators cannot exist more than once. Um, okay. Let me just maybe skip this. Uh, so okay. So I'll just mention that we also saw these two additional peaks here. They they are actually related to extremely tightly bound states between two polarons. So it's two excitons sharing one, et, one electron in a bound state, uh, like a three-body bound state here. And, and we can see that, that this is the case because of uh, some pathway analysis that maybe I don't want to go into. OK, so let me just conclude here. So um, I've discussed how you can probe the physics of the Fermi polaron using, uh, for instance, RF spectroscopy or dynamical methods like Rabi oscillations and how you can learn something about the nature of the polaron from this. Um, I've talked about you know, how this temperature dependence can signal the underlying imp signal impurity transition, which is kind of interesting, um, and has not really been done in experiment yet, at least not close to the transition. Um, and I've talked about how this repulsive branch in the context of cold atoms is dominated by this many-body defacing. Whereas in the case of the, of the 2D semiconductors, it's dominated instead by this second uh, valley. 
And then finally, I've, I've mentioned some very recent results on follow and follow on interactions. So I think I'll just, um, I should also go to the slide here. So, um, so this involved a collaboration with a lot of experiments, um, both at Lens, uh, Francesco and Matteo, at LMU, uh, uh, Nelson and Simon, and uh, at the recent semiconductor experiments are carried out by Elaine Lee and her group and by Jeff Davis. Um, and also this has involved a lot of people at Monash, uh, the student Hayden, um, a few postdocs, Weisha and Joey, and, uh, and also is involved another, uh, well, another faculty, Dmitry and Filkin, and of course also Mira. So uh, let me thank you all for your attention.